A South Vietnamese official, the military chief of Quang Ngai province, today denied charges that American soldiers on the ground executed several hundred villagers in March of 1968. Charlie Company had swept through the village and allegedly massacred everybody in the village. We know that we're going into something big and we're going to deal with them. They became increasingly brutal. We were a unit that was full of anger, frustration. We wanted contact. We wanted to fight the enemy. Executed more than 500 unarmed men, women and children. She says it was American soldiers who shot them. The intelligence was bad as it always is. He added he had been following orders. Once the first civilian was killed, it was too late. I'd never seen anything like that. It was bad. If the orders for that operation included unarmed, unresisting men, women, children and babies, it was illegal. And a soldier has a duty to disobey such an order. Did you yourself, Captain, actually see the shooting of old men or women or children? No, I did not. God got me. He'll get you for what we did. Hello, everybody. My name is Shelby Nave, and today we're going to be talking about the Vietnam War. Well, part of it at least. Today I want to talk about the massacre that occurred in the village of My Lai in 1967, which is an event that our own government attempted to erase from history. I've always known that the US has done shady things and has pretended that it wasn't a big deal. We see that today as well. But it will never not be astonishing to me that not only did something like this happen, but that it was blatantly attempted to be covered up. As always, I try my best to always fact check myself. If I say something today that you don't think is accurate, please nicely let me know in the comments below. Now let's get into it. Our story starts in December of 1966, when 140 members of Charlie Company, considered to be the best in the 1st 20th Battalion, began training in Hawaii. For those of you who aren't too familiar with the Vietnam War, I think it's important to note that this war in particular caused the largest military draft in American history. What does that mean? Conscription, better known as the draft, is the mandatory enlistment into the country's armed forces, all men between ages of 18 to 26 are required to register with the Selective Service System in the event that conscription is necessary and those men would be required to serve in the military. Women are excluded from the draft, but of course if they want to volunteer they are welcome to join the military. A lot of men were drafted into the Vietnam War and the average age for troops during that time was 21, but some were there as young as 17. Obviously it's kind of scary to think about a 17 year old getting sent to war, but a lot of the young men at the time that's what they felt they had to do. They felt that it was kind of their duty just as an American citizen that, yeah, you know, we should go serve in war. Many of these boys had generations ahead of them from, you know, World War II and the Korean War vets. So naturally to them, enlisting in the military kind of felt like the right thing to do. And a lot of these people just wanted to like see the war for themselves. The men were trained in Hawaii under Captain Ernest Medina, who would be described as the type of individual you would follow anywhere and do anything for. Another important player was Lieutenant William Calley, leader of the first platoon for Charlie Company. From many interviews that I watched about Lieutenant Calley specifically, it kind of seemed like he was often the odd man out. He was described as constantly always trying to please Captain Medina, and he would often be doing these things to try to prove himself, some of them just being kind of uncalled for. It seems that Callie was the type of person who cared a lot about rank and seniority in that way, and that ultimately isolated him from the rest of the group. On December 3rd, 1967, Charlie Company arrived in the Quang Nai province in Vietnam, and for the first month or so on the ground, they were kind of wondering if there was a war going on at all. Not only did they have a lot of downtime and just free time to do whatever, but when they arrived at many of these villages, it was peaceful. Soldiers set up perimeters around these villages and would play with like all the little village children and everything while medics would come in and would kind of give medical assistance to the villagers. One My Lai survivor even remembered specifically in the beginning of the war that it was a good day to see when American soldiers were coming. They would bring medical supplies and sweets for the kids. And when her own children came and asked her if they should be fearful of American soldiers, she said no. Why? Because Americans don't 
kill civilians. Two months after arriving in Vietnam, Charlie Company was detailed to Task Force Barker with the task of breaking the infrastructure of the Viet Cong in the central plain of the Quang Nai province. I think it's also a little important to note that the Quang Nai province kind of had a history of hating any sort of foreign powers coming into their land. It didn't matter who you were. Therefore, large areas of the Quang Nai province were considered pre-fire zones, meaning these zones were under near constant attack and constant bombings. As Charlie Company came closer and closer to the area nicknamed Pinkville, things started to get a little out of hand. It was nicknamed Pinkville because on military maps, the area was highlighted in like a shimmery pink color. So naturally it was nicknamed to Pinkville and this was the area where the increase of casualties started happening. The Vietnam War was the war that was known for guerrilla warfare. Sure, guerrilla warfare had been used in wars in the past, but the Vietnam War kind of took it to a whole new level. Like the warfare was ruthless, it was harsh, it had no rule book, pretty much the most intense form of warfare there could be. Landmines, snipers, and booby traps pretty much had all of the men in Charlie Company living in constant fear, and men were just starting to drop like flies. When it came to things like snipers and booby traps, it was almost just like spinning the roulette wheel. Nobody was safe, and your survival was kind of just up to chance. It was a roll of the dice. Just being on the ground was a threat. The choice of where to put your feet could be life or death. This went on for several weeks, and with more and more casualties, all of the members of Charlie Company started to become more and more frustrated because they were losing men, but to these like traps, like to these booby traps. And of course, there's no way to like fight back from that. You can't fight a landmine. You can't fight a sniper. But it got even worse one day when two different platoons in Charlie Company entered two different minefields almost simultaneously. Once the first mine was tripped, anybody who moved was setting off booby traps. It was like non-stop. Somebody would go to try to help somebody trip the booby trap, they would hit a booby trap, they'd get blown up. We were there for each other, and that was the problem. Somebody got hurt, you went to help. You didn't care about the other mines, you went to help somebody. This was one of the most devastating times for Charlie Company. I couldn't even begin to imagine how broken these men probably felt. Men that have already experienced so much loss, brutal, merciless loss, and are somehow still left standing. One veteran described it as just having this wound that continued to get deeper and deeper every time they lost another man, and it just would never go away. When I think about not even just men, but boys, boys, 17 to 21 year old boys who are afraid to even just walk the ground, living in miserable conditions and losing their brothers who have become their family. Is it really that surprising that they started to hate? I mean, all they really had out there was each other and that's a bond that literally only them will understand. And like I said, it's gotta be so frustrating. You can't make a booby trap pay for your friend that was just blown to bits. I mean, honestly, how helpless of a feeling that would be. Charlie Company changed after this. Soldiers were desperately trying to adapt and many of them weren't playing the nice guy anymore. Everybody was now the enemy. People genuinely just did not know who they could and could not trust. And it's not like they had a map showing them which villages were friendly and which were not. There was no rules anymore because nobody could tell whether someone was a civilian or a part of the Viet Cong. So naturally, the military treated it like everyone was a part of the Viet Cong. It became the standard to just completely rip shit apart with every single village that they went to. It didn't matter whose it was. On the morning of March 16th, 1968, Charlie Company prepared to enter the village of My Lai, which to their knowledge was the home of many members of the Viet Cong. They were told that no civilians were left in the village. Anybody who's there should be assumed to be Viet Cong or a Viet Cong sympathizer. And the order was to kill and destroy. For some reason, Colonel Henderson told Captain Medina that he wanted Charlie Company to be more aggressive, that this was their chance to confront the enemy, to get revenge for those who they had lost, and to prove themselves as a combat unit. The helicopters would ferry them in three groups and drop them in the paddy fields about 200 meters from the village. The first group of men would go through, led by Cali. The second platoon would come in next. They would follow up with the third platoon and Medina's group. This was the order that came down from on high. They would have to move forward quickly and very aggressively. The intelligence that Medina was given was that all civilians had already been moved out of the village and he had no reason to question that. So again, all of these soldiers assumed that anybody left 
in this village would be Viet Cong. Upon this intelligence, Medina like hyped up his men for this fight of their life that they were all anticipating and had them bring three times the normal amount of ammo than they usually do for one of these village missions. They were clearly expecting that there was going to be great resistance and then this would literally be Charlie Company's fight for vengeance, fight of their life, the, the fight of the war for them. The problem though, was that the information that was given to them was completely false. Charlie Company was convinced that they were going to be facing the enemy head on, when in reality, the Viet Cong Battalion was more than 150 miles away on the complete other side of the Quang Nai province. So the entire reasoning for going to My Lai in the first place was completely wrong. To which I wanna know who over in intelligence dropped the ball on this one. Who f up. This isn't just a little oops, this is a big problem. When soldiers arrived in the village, they started shooting pretty much immediately upon hitting the dirt. Complete madness broke out, and American soldiers began ruthlessly destroying the village, setting it on fire, killing people, throwing grenades into bunkers, all out chaos. However, upon checking out the situation, some soldiers stopped and looked around and were like, these are all women, children, and elderly. Everyone is unarmed and unresisting. Maybe something's wrong here. Not only were civilians getting murdered, but for some soldiers, any sort of moral compass that they once had was completely thrown out the window, and they were doing some things that were truly hard to believe. One soldier held a woman at gunpoint and forced her to perform oral sex on him before chopping off her hair and killing her. Another woman was shot by a group of soldiers and kicked to death before they all unloaded their magazines into her head. Cruel, gruesome, unbelievable acts done at the hands of American soldiers. Someone who bore witness to this was photographer Ron Herbley. Hey everybody, Shelby over in editing here. For some reason, throughout this video, I keep saying Ron Haberly's name wrong. I keep saying Herbally. So I just wanted to address the fact that his name is Haberly. And anytime in the future that I say it wrong, I'm just gonna dub over myself. So if it sounds weird, sorry. But I said his name wrong so frequently in this video that I feel like it's necessary. That is all carry on. The media team that Ron Haberly was a part of would be covering the operation for Stars and Stripes and would routinely send stories and photos to hometown newspapers so the folks back at home could see how the guys of their town were involved in the war. Haberly had a military camera that was in black and white, but he also had his own camera in color that he would use for the media purposes of sending photos and stories and things like that back to the States for news coverage. It said that Ron Haberly was just completely flabbergasted at what he was seeing. As he was photographing the bodies, a four-year-old boy came into his view. The boy was wounded in the foot and was limping around, crying and looking for his mother among the dead. He he found her, kneeled down, and took her hand in his. Haberly was about to capture the heart-rending scene on film when he was startled by the crack of a rifle fire just two feet from his ear. The fatal shot flipped the boy, knocking him in the middle of the group of bodies. Haberly turned and looked into the cold, dark eyes of a soldier who just fired. He seemed to be 18 or 19 years old. He cocked his head to the side slightly in a questioning gesture to ask why. The soldier looked back at him with a blank stare, with a face devoid of any thought or feeling before turning and walking away. Haberly Haberly was on the verge of tears as the soldiers stepped over the bodies and continued on down the road, seemingly unaffected by what just happened. There's another part of his story specifically where a bunch of soldiers had rounded up a group of pretty much just women and children. And when he came walking by, another soldier saw him and was just like, hey, the camera guy's here. So all soldiers just kind of like backed off a little bit. Ron snapped a picture of these people, thinking at the time that, that they were just going to be questioned or just kind of held for the time being. But right after he snapped snapped the picture of them and started walking away, he heard a whole bunch of soldiers just completely open fire on all of them. Medina had pretty much no interest in knowing what was actually going on, and that was a huge problem because it resulted in a major loss of discipline. Soldiers look to their officers because that's what they've been trained to do. So when positions of power start behaving badly, then all discipline falls apart. Most of these soldiers are so just traumatized by not knowing who is good and who is bad, and they look to their officers to kind of figure that out and their officers don't know, so they're pretty much f***ed either way with whatever they do. I think for many of the soldiers and the veterans who were a part of this day, oftentimes justify their actions by saying that they were following orders. Uh, I have 
I have very mixed emotions about the whole following orders concept in particular. On the one hand, it is already shocking to me enough that soldiers just have the ability to completely set aside any sort of ethical code or moral compass for the sake of following orders. But then there's this other part of me that feels like I really can't even blame them because that's what they are trained to do. And I think that's a problem with the military more than anything. It kind of blows my mind that there's even a kill and destroy order for missions in the first place? Because I think that there's always going to be exceptions. Mistakes, miscommunications, unexpected things that rise are all means to cause exceptions for any situation. For example, it should be kill and destroy, unless it's an unarmed civilian. Maybe we shouldn't butcher the unresisting children and elderly. Not even just because we're Americans who allegedly protect the innocent, but because they are a human being and this is inhumane. I know I'm really working myself up about this and I wasn't there. I don't know what it's like to be in the military, okay? I get it, I know that. However, whether these soldiers are just mercilessly killing people or just following orders, both are a pretty big issue issue in my eyes. I understand that there has to be some sort of discipline in the military. It wouldn't work otherwise, but this is borderline brainwash. In an effort to bring a little bit of optimism back to your day, it is important to know that not all troops participated in this massacre. Warrant officer and army helicopter pilot Hugh Thompson and his Hiller OH-23 Raven crew, Larry Colburn and Glenn Andreata, were assigned to Task Force Barker with the responsibility to fly over the jungle and draw enemy fire giving the attack helicopters a chance to eliminate the enemy. At first, Thompson and his men really did think that they were helping out the men on the ground, but they soon came to realize that there was no returning enemy fire. They could see people running away from the area that they thought civilians were getting moved out of. However, when they circled back, those same people were either dying or already dead, just laying in the road. Of course, at this point, Thompson and his crew is just like, what the f is going on here? Something really doesn't seem right. So they just stayed at a hover for a while and just kind of watched what was happening. They saw a captain approach a woman in the street who was still alive with a chest wound and they watched him kick her then step back and shoot her to death. They found out later that this was Captain Medina who did this. But not only that, many of the soldiers were herding all of the civilians towards this large drainage ditch on the east side of the village where Lieutenant Callie's platoon was. This is where Thompson actually got out of his helicopter and was just like, Hey guys, these are civilians. Like we're supposed to be helping them. To the response that he received from a sergeant named David Mitchell was, yeah, we'll help them out. We'll help them out of their misery. This was really hard for Thompson to believe was even happening. In a documentary I watched, someone said that he was thinking of just like any possible reasoning that they would be doing this and that they would deserve the benefit of the doubt. But when he got back to his helicopter and took off, they all could hear the firing of automatic weapons and Lieutenant Callie gave the order to shoot shoot all of these people and they fell into this drainage ditch. Nazis do shit like that. I thought we were Americans. It's hard for me to even fathom someone being so heartlessly cruel to another human being. And I imagine for Thompson specifically, like the amount of shock he was probably seeing, like nobody wants to believe that your fellow soldiers would do something like this. And he even radioed into headquarters and was just like, yo, something's wrong here. People are killing civilians. And it was then and there that he turned to his crew on his helicopter and was just like, I'm going to intervene. I'm going to save these people. Are you with me? Which both Colburn and Andreata said they were with them and they took off in pursuit of rescuing the civilians who were still alive. Thompson spotted a group of civilians running from the village to a bunker with Charlie Company right on their tail coming after them. He told his crew that he was going to get these people out himself and if these American soldiers fire at the civilians or him, to shoot them. Then he landed the aircraft in between the civilians and the soldiers blocking them off. About 10 people came out of the bunker and he's in a scout plane, like those aren't very big. So he called one of his friends named Dan Millens who was piloting one of the gunships to help him pick up the rest of the people. And they said in this documentary that I was watching that's just like gunships do not come and just land in enemy territory. That's just like not heard of, people don't do that. So it was kind of a big deal that not only he, you know, came to help out Thompson, but just that, I guess it's just another disobeying of orders, but they did it to get those people out. It wasn't just Thompson and his men that were wanting to do something about this. There was plenty of men on the ground who just refused to kill these people in a ditch. And sometimes it honestly became really hard to say those who just refused and those 
who carried out orders because if they didn't, they ran the risk of getting shot themselves. A lot of people talk about me lie and they say, well, you know, yeah, but you can't follow an illegal order. Trust me, there is no such thing. Not in the military. If I go into a combat situation, I tell them, no, I'm not going. I'm not going to do that. And they put me up against the wall and shoot me. You teach him to be a soldier. You train him to kill. You train him to follow orders. You express to him the importance of following orders. And you train him to kill. True, we kill our enemies. But there comes a point in time at which you don't kill your enemy. He's entitled to be treated humanely. Callie specifically threatened to shoot one of his own men for disobeying an order. And I think that also goes into the whole thing that the whole following orders thing can be so f***ed up sometimes. Cause not only do you have people who do just mentally shut off and do what they're told to do, but you also have people who are stopped by their own personal morals and like, hey, I don't want to be a part of this, this isn't right, who have their officers and their superiors threatening to kill them if they don't do as they're told. Sometimes it's hard for me to put blame on just the normal ground soldiers because they're caught in this pickle of morals and fear for their own life themselves. Like a lot of them felt like they didn't have a choice at all. One of the men in Charlie Company, his name was Paul Meadlow. Callie often picked upon him to help him with just killing civilians because Paul was described as someone who just had a strong sense of duty and just did as he was told. And I remember a specific excerpt from this book that just said that, yeah, he'd be going around and doing what he was told, but he was like actively silent sobbing through it. And like, how heartbreaking of a position would that be? It's just like, your officer is making you kill innocent people, and if you don't, he's gonna kill you? Midway through the shooting, an emotionally shaken Meadlow stopped and tried to hand his weapon to another soldier who was standing by, who all refused to take it. Kelly pointed his weapon at a soldier, threatening to shoot him for disobeying a direct order. So some of the soldiers kind of, you know, bounded up together against Kelly and were just like, no, we're not doing this. But some of them felt they had to. And Callie uh, took Meadlow as the point man. They just barely got out of sight. And Meadlow stepped on a mine, blew his foot off. And uh, when they were medevacking him out, the last thing he yelled at Callie was, God got me, he'll get you for what we did. Thompson and his crew reported what they saw to many superiors, including Colonel Henderson, who seemed to kind of brush off the affair like he took some notes, but didn't seem overly flustered by the situation. And this did not go over well for Thompson. He was infuriated by this because he reported this incident thinking that something was going to be done about it. And there wasn't. Meanwhile, back in Me Live, Thompson's reports had gone up the chain and actually caused a ceasefire to be ordered to Medina. And even though these orders were in place, once in a while, randomly, they would still hear shots being fired. And then again, everybody would yell ceasefire, which, what the f***? Why are people still following orders to kill and destroy when the orders have changed to not kill anymore? Anyway, the cover-up of what just happened started almost immediately. Medina radioed into headquarters and reported completely false numbers of the amount of Viet Cong killed. He said that 123 total Viet Cong were eliminated and any civilian deaths were due to, are you ready for this? Friendly fire. Sure, if by 123 Viet Cong you mean 500 civilians and by friendly fire you mean deliberate murder, then sure, that's exactly what happened. It makes total sense if you don't think about it because LOL, there was no Viet Cong there in the first place and your intelligence was wrong. This was a blatant lie to the US military. It didn't matter what Medina said though. As soon as Charlie Company returned, everybody kind of already knew that something fishy had gone on there. Weeks had gone by since Me Lai and there was still no buzz happening involving the massacre, Thompson started getting sent out onto missions to very dangerous areas by himself. He apparently destroyed four or five helicopters over the course of a two month period. The last crash he was in, he ended up breaking his back and he became pretty sure that someone was trying to kill him off or to get him to go away. But same with the men from Charlie Company, they got put way out from everybody else, presumably to keep them from talking. And many of them felt that by the really just bizarre orders that they were being given, the horrible living conditions they were in and the isolation was the military trying to get them to not come home from the war. For Thompson specifically, after breaking his back, he got sent back to the United States where he received no debriefing, no readjustment counseling, no advice on dealing with the growing number of his own countrymen who were adamantly opposed to any US involvement in the Vietnam War. But also too, he was just kind of like, why isn't anybody talking 
about this massacre? Why have there been no arrests? Why has nothing been done about this? Another person concerned with the coverage or lack thereof of the My Lai massacre was Ron Rittenhauer. He had befriended many members of Charlie Company and I think just over time gathered a pretty good understanding of what happened that day in My Lai. And he wrote a letter to many powerful people in the government and it kind of shook Washington for a bit. But not only that, on November 20th on page one and page four of the Cleveland Plain Dealer, photographic evidence of the My Lai massacre was presented to the public for the first time. The stunning, almost unbelievable pictures taken by Army photographer Ron Haberly showed women, children, and old men who had been gunned down by U.S. soldiers. What Rittenhauer's letter had done quietly, Haberly's photographs did in a loud and disturbing manner. With Rittenhauer's letter, Thompson's eyewitness account, and Haberly's photos being released to the public, Inspector General William Wilson knew that the first investigation of this was probably a cover-up. Wilson now knew, without a doubt, that something dark and evil had occurred in Me Lai, just as Rittenhauer had written. He likewise figured with certainty that the Army's first investigation of the incident was no investigation at all, but rather part of a sinister plot to cover up war crimes committed against the very people whom American soldiers were in Vietnam to protect. Colonel Wilson reported his findings to the Secretary of the Army, Stanley Resser, who was greatly disturbed to learn with certainty that not only were these crimes committed by U.S. soldiers, but that they were apparently covered up by the superior officers whom he had trusted to report truthfully. The original investigation by the Army had been worse than a watered-down version of the truth. It was a deliberate misstatement of facts, a lie. Obviously, one of the biggest offenders was our Lieutenant William Cowley, who was actually arrested in September of 1969. Lieutenant William Cowley was charged with murder of 109 Vietnamese civilians, the following month, Sergeant David Mitchell was charged with assault with intent to murder 30 Vietnamese civilians. In the months to come, more than 20 others will be charged. Shortly after people started getting charged for their crimes, another report came out revealing Thompson's identity. He was no longer being referred to as the helicopter pilot he was referred to directly. And he started receiving a lot of hate from people. But I mean, People are charged. That's a good thing, right? I mean, you would hope so. The next part of the story I like to call the sabotage of the trials. Hello again, everybody. I decided that I'm going to cut this video in half. Just because there's a lot of information and to make everything a little more digestible, I thought that I would give it in two parts. So I hope you guys enjoyed part one. Make sure you stick around because I will be posting part two very soon. If you like this video, definitely give me a thumbs up down below and don't forget to subscribe. It really does help me out. But as always, thank you guys so much for watching and stay tuned for part two. I'll see you the next time I upload a new video.